This morning, we're going to start a new series of messages from the book of Ruth. So if you'll take your Bibles and turn to page 407. Go ahead and turn there and see where you're at. I'm in Ruth. So if Ruth is not there, find Ruth. It's right after Judges in the Old Testament. This has been called the greatest piece of literature ever written. It's called the Cinderella story of the Bible. It's about how a pagan girl named Ruth came to be part of the covenant people of Israel. We're going to see a young lady pursued by grace and bought out of a wretched condition. We're going to see a young lady that was redeemed. That's really the whole theme of the book of Ruth. It's about Jesus, like every book in the Bible is. And Boaz is going to picture Jesus in this story as our kinsman redeemer. We're going to learn what, the, what that's all about as we go through uh, this book and this study. It's a story of love. It's a story of redemption. A story of grace and hope. There's only two books in the Bible named after a woman. There's Esther, who was a Jewess who married a heathen husband. Remember the story of Esther? She married uh, the king of a Gentile empire. Then there's Ruth, who is a heathen Gentile woman who marries a Hebrew husband. It's a beautiful story of God's great love for us, for the redemption that he offers us. So if you love love stories, you're going to enjoy this study in the book of Ruth. We're introduced to a family of a man named Elimelech. And he lived in the days of the Judges. This follows the book of Judges. And if you've studied that book, you know that it was a time before the kings, a time when they were ruled by judges. But it was not a good time. Matter of fact, look at the last verse of Judges. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? I think we're living in a day and time when most people do what's right in their own eyes. They don't do what's wrong in their own eyes. They do what they think is right. But does it agree with the Word of God? Most times it doesn't. So Elimelech and his family make a decision. They decide to leave Bethlehem, their hometown, and move to Moab, a pagan country. Matter of fact, a country under the curse of God. They leave the house of bread, which is what Bethlehem means. They leave Judah which means land of praise, and they go to Moab, an accursed place under God. That's not a wise move, is it? Man, you don't want to move your family to Moab. It doesn't work out very well. Moab was a people who worshipped pagan gods. They were descendants of, of Moab, who was one of the sons of Lot by an incestuous relationship. They were a lawless people. They were an immoral people. They were a violent people. They were the bitter enemies of Israel, the Moabites. Matter of fact, God says in Psalm 60, verse 8, Moab is my wash pot. Now, if you come back tonight, Brother Matt's going to preach. If you look at the title, Three Widows in a Wash Pot. If you look at that, say, what in the world is that all about? Well, that's what God called Moab. It was a place where you washed your dirty feet. They were a despised people unto God because of their idolatry and wickedness. And it's to this despised, wicked nation that Elimelech moves his family. And the consequences are devastating. So let's look at this morning, chapter 1. We're going to note the first seven verses for our text this morning. 
if you would stand with me and honor to God's word if you're physically able. I want you to follow along as we begin Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. That came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. A certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife, Naomi, the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. They came into the country of Moab and continued there, and Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, not Oprah, Orpah. The name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread back in Bethlehem and Israel. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. She's going home. Amen. You may be seated. You want to take notes this morning? We're going to know several things about what happens to this family who left Israel, left Bethlehem, and moved to Moab to live among the Moabites. First of all, you see, it was a time of desperate circumstances. Time of desperate circumstances because a famine came into the land. It was a material family, material famine. A time when there was an extended dearth, no rainfall. The food was very scarce, very serious shortage. But that's not the only famine they experienced. It was also a time of moral famine. It was during the times of the judges. It was a time of darkness. When the attitude of the people was summed up in that last verse that we read in the book of Judges a time of turbulence, a time of social upheaval. They were days marked by lawlessness, by idolatry, by drunkenness, by sexual perversion, by division and unbelief. Sounds like our day, doesn't it? Are we not living in some dark days here in America? I, I've been around long enough, I've seen that the direction our nation is heading, it's away from God. It's away from the house of God. It's away from the Word of God. We're living in dark days. People are doing what they think is right in their own eyes. But you know, God can use a famine to bring His people back. When we stray away from God, sometimes God reaches out to us in discipline. He may send a famine into your life. might be a financial famine that you're going through that God is trying to use to get your attention. Some of you, maybe there's more month than there is money. Amen? The money runs out before the month does. We go through financial famine. Some are going through a physical famine when their health is taken. Some go through a spiritual famine, when souls are not saved and the church does not grow. There are various famines that we can endure, amen? Now, not always is that God disciplining us, but sometimes it is. Sometimes it's God's way of trying to get our attention. And he does this not to drive you away, but to draw you back. Sometimes people go through difficult times and they get bitter, don't they? That's not what God wants. God doesn't want you to get bitter. What does He want? He wants you to get better. He wants to draw you back to Him and back into His blessings. 
that he might bless your family and your church and your nation once again. Second thing I want you to see is that it was a time of dangerous choices. As we see, Elimelech did not respond correctly to the famine that came upon them, and, and he responded incorrectly. He made some dangerous choices. They chose, first of all, to leave the promised land. That's a bad choice, wasn't it? Because God's blessings are in Israel. God made a covenant with Israel that he would provide for them and protect them. The blessings are in the land. Now today, it's not so much that the blessings are in the land, the blessings are in the Lord today. It's not about being in a particular land or a country, it's being in the Lord. But back then, there was a covenant God made with Israel. And they're in Bethlehem. As I said, it means house of bread. Judah means praise, the land of praise. Matter of fact, the name Elimelech is a good name. You see, it begins with E-L. That's a key, isn't it? Any name that, that begins with E-L or ends with E-L has a reference to God. Elimelech. And it, it means my God is king. That's what it means. But he's not living that way, is he? If my God is king, I'm not going to go move to Moab where they don't know my God. So he's not living up to his name. And he should have known that God's valleys do not last forever. That God's going to take care of his people. Because Boaz didn't leave, did he? I'm going to introduce you to Boaz a little bit later as we go through this. But there were a lot of people that stayed put and God blessed eventually. So if things are going rough, the last thing you want to do is leave God's house and God's place and God's people. They left God's people too. They left them behind when they moved to Moab. So they chose to leave the land of promise where their inheritance was to move to a pagan land. I mean, moving to Moab is kind of like moving to Texas, I guess. It, you know, where God is not and... Oh, you Texans, I'm sorry. I'm... But uh, they left the promised land, and number two, they chose to live in a polluted land. Moab, I mean, living in Moab would be a, a clear violation of God's commandment. He chose the forbidden path over the commandment of God's word. To leave one's inheritance back then was equivalent to denying the faith because the covenant is with Israel. And to leave Israel, the promised land, is like denying the faith and what God has said. It was a separation from God. It was a separation from the temple of God. It was a separation from the sacrifices to God. A separation from the festivals that they enjoyed every year. All that they left behind when they went to Moab. To live in a polluted land. Totally isolated from the things of God and from the people of God. And Elimelech, taking his family there, exposes them to evil, to idolatry. Parents, be careful where you take your family. I mean, the first, the first thing to consider is not how much money I'll make. That's beside the point. There are some things more important than making money. You don't need to take your family off somewhere where there's no house of God, where there's no place to worship, where there's no way that you can serve the Lord God. That's what Elimelech did. He took them to Moab. He exposed his family to these things. What happened? His boys married Moabite women. It's never right for a child of God to marry an infidel. Amen. We see that today, don't we? Many times we see 
those that have been raised in church and profess to know the Lord Jesus Christ marry outside their faith, and it usually never works well. You need to wait on that person God has in mind for you. And it will be a blessing to your family. There's no way to be right with God if you're wrong about His Word. If you're away from His worship and His will, things are just going to go downhill. If you want to walk out on God and get involved in the things of the world, it will destroy your family. So man, listen up. Let's not make the same mistake that Elimelech made. The third thing I want you to see is they chose to linger in a prodigal land. Did you notice it said that they were going to sojourn in Moab? I think that means that they were just going to go there for a little while until things got better. Then they would go back home. So they left intending to come back, but week after week passed, month after month, year after year, and before you know it, ten years have passed. And they're still in Moab. Folks, that shows us the deceptive nature of sin. You want to just play with sin a little bit? Think it'll be okay? Doesn't work that way, does it? It'll just draw you in and get you deeper and deeper involved. A lot of people never meant to get very far from the Lord and His church. They were just going to be away for a little while. But before they know it, years have passed. They've been out of church and out of service to God. I've seen members here at Florence Street who were once very faithful, but they get out of church for some reason. And they're living in Moab. Today, we've got church members, folks, they are living in Moab. They're outside of God's will. They're away from God's blessings and God's covenant. Some got offended, and they left. Never come back. Oh, some say, well, preacher, I felt led to leave. You ever hear that? I felt led to leave. Brother Lord gave me a chunk of lead put in my pocket. He said, Brother West, if you ever want to feel lead, pull that out and just hold on to it. Now, so, a lot of people, I'm not saying that, that it never happens. I'm sure sometimes God may lead you to go somewhere else where you can serve him. I don't think he ever leads you to go home and stay there. God wants you involved somewhere serving him. But some get out of the habit of attending faithfully. They were sojourning in Moab, but they never came back. Some once attended very faithfully here. I can remember back some, some people that never missed a service. They were here for every service. But then after a while, I noticed they start skipping Wednesday night. Then after a while, they start skipping Sunday night. They're only coming on Sunday morning. Then after a while, they don't even come every Sunday morning. They just come occasionally on Sunday morning. And then before long, they're just out completely. It wasn't that they woke up one morning and thought, you know what, I think I'll forsake the house of God and never go back. I don't think that way. It's a gradual thing. Amen? You slowly drift into this. It is drifting. And most people will drift away from the house of God in the way of God. Be careful about that. You know, going to Moab doesn't always involve a, phys a physical move. A lot of people are living in Moab even though they attend church regularly. Now listen to me. Where are you living? Some people want to live in Moab during the week and just sojourn into Israel once a week. On Sunday morning, they leave Moab to come, spend a little time with the people of God, then they go right back to Moab. By that I mean they're not living like they ought to. They're not living a godly, consecrated life. 
They're not being the kind of witness or the kind of testimony they ought to be. They prefer the Moabites over the people of God. Like the Moabites, they use their tongue as a weapon instead of as a witness. They harbor grudges. They're unforgiving. They're critical, quick to find fault. Folks, not all prodigals leave the father's house physically. I think the elder son had stayed was a prodigal. The elder son had stayed home. Remember, he got upset when his father embraced his younger brother when he returned home. Now, if you're convicted, not my intention to rub salt in the wound. I want to help you today. I want you to get out of Moab and get back into the house of bread and land of praise where you belong. Here's the third thought this morning. It was a time of deadly consequences. Sin carries bad, harsh consequences, folks. I see, first of all, there was discipline on that home. I think before he moved to Moab, Elimelech had already moved away from God in his heart. No one just wakes up and decides to leave God behind. As I said, it's a slow, subtle process where people move further and further away from God and God's will. Say, so, preacher, how do you know there was discipline on this home? Notice the, the names of the two sons born to them in verse 2. Two sons born, Malon and Chilion. Malon means sick, sickly. He's a sickly child. The other name means pining, also dealing with being sickly. It, it seems that neither one of these boys were very healthy. They were sickly. Maybe God was trying to get their attention before they ever left for Moab. When a backslidden spirit begins to manifest itself, folks, God is going to move to correct you. God's not going to just allow you to go on in disobedience. As our Heavenly Father and as our loving Father, God is going to act. Not only was there discipline on that home, but they did go on to Moab, and next we see there's death in that home. In spite of God's working, Elimelech moves his family to Moab. What was a reality in his heart now becomes a reality in his life. And after some time, we, we see that he dies. He's taken in death. God had given him. Ten years to repent and return. But time finally ran out on this family. Folks, listen, if all else fails, God will take rebellious children home early. Elimelech died. His two sons both died. God took them home early. The Bible says there's a sin unto death. You know it's in the Bible, there's a sin unto death. Not any particular sin, it's just crossing the line. Where you go on and sin for so long that God finally says, that's enough. And God will take you home early. As a matter of discipline. So, death comes into this home. And then number three, there was defeat in that home. Here's Naomi, now a widow. Her two daughters-in-law are now widows. They have nothing. They're desolate. They're discouraged. They're defeated. All she had to show for her backsliding in Moab now is three graves. Three graves in Moab. And it should have not have been that way, folks. Such is the nature of sin. It never brings anything good. Folks, listen, when you, when you disobey God, when you rebel against God, it's never going to bring anything good. Not to you and not to your family. Some people have a hard time learning that lesson. That's the nature of sin. 
It may give you some pleasure in the flesh for a little while. But in the long run, it's only going to bring defeat. And men, if you want to protect your family, don't take them to Moab. And if they're in Moab today, get them out. Get them out of there and get them back to the blessings of God. Your family depends on you to do that. Men, I want to remind you, God made you the spiritual leader of that home. You say, well, Brother West, I gave that to my wife. I'm going to let her be the spiritual leader. No, that's not what God said. God's going to hold you accountable, men. You're going to stand before God one day, and you're going to give an account for how well you led your home. If you're not the spiritual leader you ought to be, you're going to have to answer for it. What's more, your family's going to have to answer for it. Because families suffer when the man does not take the lead he should. Amen. Don't be an Elimelech. He lost his family. Here's a final thought. It was a time of deliberate changes. Let's get a little hope here into this story. Because out of death and defeat, we catch a glimpse of hope here. First of all, it's a time of realization for Naomi. She got word that God was blessing again back in Israel, back in Bethlehem. In truth, he had never stopped blessing. Amen. He never stopped blessing. Even his chastening is a blessing. It's something we need. So Naomi goes home. She remembers the house of bread. She remembers the land of praise. She remembers the sweet fellowship she once had with God's people. Like the prodigal son, she came to herself and wanted to return home. A time of realization comes to many people who have wandered away from God. Because God acts and God moves in a way to remind them of what they've left behind and how that they need to return. Like the prodigal, he heard the father say, come home, come home. Folks, your heavenly father is calling many today to come home. Rise up. And get back to that place of blessing, that place of hope. Time of realization. I hope some today will come to a realization that you need to get back to where you once were. You need to come home. Then is a time of repentance for Naomi. She rose up, she leaves Moab behind. I think it's a picture of one repenting, turning around and going back to the Lord. And for those today who are living in Moab, if you can look back and remember a time when you were closer to God than you are today, you need to go back. You need to get back to where you once were. You need to repent. You need to repent of ever leaving the Lord behind, ever getting out of God's house and God's service. Time to get back to the altar. Time to get things right with God once again. And if you're thinking about leaving and going to Moab, you need to stop right now. That's not the wise choice to make. If you need to come back, God, one of the promises we stand on, God promises to receive all those who will come back. Amen. God's always ready and willing and waiting for the prodigal to come home. Then number three is a time of returning for Naomi. She did rise up. She heads back to Judah. She's going back to the land of praise. She's going back to where she should have been all along. She's going home. Folks, listen. God has never saved any of us that we might live in Moab. Unless you want to go there as a missionary. Try to get them saved. But to go into Moab and live among them and live like them is not God's will. God has a will for every child of God. 
He saved us that we might worship him in spirit and in truth. He saved us that we might be used to his glory and honor, that we might live a life filled with joy and peace and fruitfulness. That's God's will. You'll never be happy in Moab. Not if you're a child of God. A child of God cannot be happy in Moab. Moab's going to rob you of your joy. It's going to rob you of your peace and your praise and usefulness. When Naomi went into Moab, by her own testimony, in verse 21, she said, I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home empty. I left full, I've come back empty. God has taken everything from my life. All of her hopes and dreams are now reduced to three graves in Moab. She left everything behind. Folks, when you, look, when you move to Moab, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. You're going to lose your testimony. Now, you may not think that's important, but it's the most important thing you've got. You don't want to lose your testimony. You may lose your wealth. You may lose your health. You may lose your family. You may lose your life. These are the tragic lessons from Elimelech. And if you're unsaved, there's a message here for you too. God is calling you, like Ruth, to leave the Moabites and cast your lot with God's people. Ruth was a Moabite. As we go along, come back tonight. Brother Matt's going to continue this. A very, very interesting message you'll hear tonight about these three widows in a wash pot. All three of these widows make a decision Matt's going to talk about tonight. But I'm going to just jump a little ahead. Ruth makes a good decision. She decides to leave her home country of Moab, that kingdom of darkness, to go with Naomi to the land of God. Ruth gets saved. We'll put it that way. Ruth gets saved. The Moabites could get saved. God wanted to save the Moabites. He gave them many years to repent, but they would not leave their idol to trust in God. But if you're not saved, do like Ruth did. Leave your old life behind enter a new life follow the Lord Jesus Christ walk with him join the people of God if you need a church home we'd love to have you come join us make this your family enter into the fellowship of God's people here at Florence Street it'll be good for you you need brothers and sisters in Christ who can encourage you and lift you up if you don't Lost friend, if you don't come to Christ, you die in your sin, you'll be cast out for all eternity. I say that with a broken heart. If you die without Christ, you die without hope. No, that's not God's will. God loves you. God wants to save you. But if you'll come to him, that's what he'll do. Not God's will that any perish, but all come so if you're not saved, we're going to give you an opportunity this morning to come and profess your faith in Jesus Christ. You might say, well, preacher, I believe in my heart, but I've never publicly professed my faith in Christ. You know, the Bible says that with the heart man believeth, with the tongue he confesses. You need to confess your faith in Christ. You need to stand up for Jesus. He doesn't need any secret agents. Amen. We all need to stand up and be counted and walk with the Lord and be a witness for him.